these two have me, actually these three have, are way up on, on the <laughs> number of years of being in the schools because I, I left and started working with, with pre-service teachers teaching science methods. So that's my background. You need to call me out and say, talk about math. I sometimes slip into saying science methods, science, just because it's just a habit and I've taught in this classroom. So call me out and say, wait a second. Um, and we have two of our mentors here today who are going to be presenting. So Lynn Gilbert, who is retired from Thompson School District but still can't stay out of the classroom, so she still teaches part-time. And then Mike Viney, who's retired from Pooter School District, who can't stay out of the classroom, so he's still working here and still doing teaching stuff. So they're not really, they're not really good models for people who are retired <laughs> because they're still <laughs> working with students and free service teachers. But that's, we're so grateful. The third mentor, who I'm not sure if she can make it, Janet. Janet is coming back. She had to go work with some grad students and then she'll. Okay, so she's another example of someone who is, was a former teacher from Greeley and also in Pooter School District at Fort Collins High School. Can't help herself but work with students and teach. So she should be here. She's our third mentor. So um, we've got uh, two, two folks who I hope would love to, I hope they stay. One is Valerie. Um, Valerie is not an official NOICE member. She's going to be an unofficial NOICE member. And if she joins our community for this year, then she'll be considered for a NOICE grant in her home state of California. So she's going to be part of our team. Um, I can't remember the professor's name. I can't remember. Um, Oh yeah, he'll blow or something. Yeah, he. I don't remember what's his first name. Is it? Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Ed. So Ed um, said that he was so impressed with our noise community. He said, "Oh yeah, this will count. This is pretty rigorous. So we need to make sure we are inclusive of Valerie. Do you want to say what your content area is or any other? Yeah, I just want to be a high school chemistry teacher and then maybe go into math. Yeah, that's what I want to do. So she's our bridge. She's going to bridge the math right now. <laughs> and Noah, tell us something about yourself. Um, studying to be a biology teacher, dating Venus. Oh, hi. I want to be your fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 The co-op? Okay. Oh, and we've got um, we've got a, a little member who maybe one day will be a future teacher. It's <laughs> Wesley back there. And Amy, do you want to tell us and you want to introduce him? Uh, he grunts, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's two and a half months old. Um, yeah, and I started student teaching, but my mentor teacher's mother fell ill. And so now I'm doing some other stuff this semester and we'll finish up next semester. But I've been yeah. here for a year and a half with the most program, I guess. And Amy is a really nice example of someone who used her support network beautifully. It's the very first thing, what did you think she did? First thing, her, her cooperating teacher said, I have to take off. Who did she contact? Who would you contact if something happened? Here, yeah, so we all have a support network. And in our noise community, we're trying to help you with your with your noise mentor. So she contacted Mike, who was her noise mentor. So remember, your mentors, Mike, Lynn, and, and Janet, are there for you so they can help you brainstorm. And so Mike and I were on email and with Dee Dee and trying to figure out how to how to find some solutions. And so so remember that Amy was using the network as it, as we had hoped. So you and you can contact any of them. They they don't mind. And Lynn actually asked if we could have some time so she could visit with you all and make sure that you have the chance to connect with, um, so you can connect with Mike and Lynn. It's pretty good. Uh, okay, so what we're going to talk about today, today is a little bit different. Normally we have a, a STEM content expert come in, and there's Janet, um, a STEM content expert, and then we, we talk about the, the connections, your quadrant connection sheet. And today what we're going to do is actually start with Lynn and uh, Mike, with Janet and Mina jumping in when they want, right? <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about interactive notebooking, which can be used in any content area, right? So think about it, think about how it would be relevant in your math or science class. Um, as usual, Dee Dee has passed these out. So can you hold that up for a second? 
And so um, for those of you who haven't used it before, um, we want, this is something we're modeling for you, you can do this with your students, to try to get them to think about content in making different types of connections. So here what we have is your personal interest to the content area. I don't know, you might say interactive notebooking is like keeping a journal, and I do that. Um, con your, your licensure area, how might you use this to support um, literacy or, or learning in your area? Social justice, which is a big, broad area. So does anyone remember what today's focus issue is? We've seen it on the invitation for DD. So testing your memory. Then the mentors are whispering. I don't want to look at them because that means that they looked at the... So diverse family structures. So, so do you have any ideas what we mean by diverse family structures? You two know because we know. <laughs> we think we know. We may not. Yeah, so what's a diverse family structure? We might have an idea when we think of, you know, what family is, but families really can be very different. Like uh, caretakers that aren't your parents, or um, people you might be close with that are like take care of you but aren't you doing good. Okay, so relatives who are non parents or, rel or non relatives who are your care providers. Uh, maybe you've got one, uh, maybe the child is from a single parent home. Maybe they have multiple parents because they're from a blended family. Maybe they have a home where they're living with two mothers or two fathers. Or maybe they're living in a home where they're raised purely by their grandparents. Or they're in a foster home. Or they're adopted. Okay. So we can think about family structures. I had a former student years ago who actually was raising both of, he was a pre-service teacher, raising both of his siblings, younger siblings. And um, went to their parent-teacher conferences. And, you know, so he was a, he said, we didn't have a safe home. I needed to get I needed to get my siblings out. And he was took responsibility for them. And he played the role of parent as well as you know trying to get his own life together. So we have no idea. Um, we might also have uh, diverse family structures might be some of your students might be parents themselves, right? And so really thinking about um, why that's important. So so that's what we have in that. I wanted to just spend some time to make sure we understood what that um, what that meant. And then finally, um, Dee Dee's favorite issue here, mm -hmm. because she's interested in place-based education, is making connections to place. So um, cultural relevance, environmental relevance, things into the community. Okay, so we'd like you to fill that out um, while Lynn and uh, Mike are going to share some, um, some strategies that they've used for interactive notebooking. Any questions? So one thing that that I think we would like you all, that all of us would like you to think about during today, um, and this is really casual. These are your mentors, so you know, jump in and, and talk when you'd like. Think about how you can use notebooks to build some uh, different types of outcomes. So what I've written here, it looks squashed here, but one is obviously academic knowledge. I mean, that's the first thing that seems most obvious. But you know, and I think Mike is going to talk about this in particular, but. Really think about how to use a notebook to build, help the student build connections between their prior knowledge and the new knowledge. So not just thinking about new knowledge, but if they're bringing examples from home or from their other, their uh, sort of traditional ways of knowing. Relationships with the teacher, that might seem not intuitive. Relationships with peers, and relationships with family members. So I'm using family broadly. So remember diverse family structure. So you may not think about these last three. The notebook is a powerful tool that can be used across across the sort of network of, of people that are helping students learn. Okay? Any questions? I'm gonna let you go while Wesley grunts. <laughs> do you want to jump up? I'm gonna let you go up okay. and I can do pop in when you I'll add. How's that? Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> just some background on me. Um, I uh, did my undergraduate work here at CSU, and some I was just gonna. I thought I'm gonna be a researcher, and someone said, "Hey, I just took this uh, education course. It's really cool, and it was an easy A, and I think you might like it." 
And so I took it, and I don't, for me it wasn't an easy day, but it just like, it just got me all excited. Because in that class we had to go observe some classrooms, and I had never really thought of teaching this career. And so I kind of just accidentally got into it. And then 30 years later, um, I retired, and it felt like the time just went by like that now to me. And I just feel extremely grateful to have found teaching as a profession because um, it's just, you know, it's not easy, but you never doubt the worth of your job. And I think um, if you're a curious person and you like to grow and you like people, then, you know, it's, it's the job for you. I'm not saying that I would have been successful at just any school. You know, maybe I lucked out there as well. I was at several different schools, but at each school that I was at, I was happy. And so there's a lot of things to consider uh, when you become a teacher, you know, where you're teaching, the subject you're teaching, uh, the population that you serve. So anyway, just with that kind of background, I think, um, you know, I was, I taught science. I really believe in hands-on science. I believe in science inquiry. You know, science is a body of knowledge, but it's important to understand how that knowledge is incorporated into and accepted by science, and so you need to know science as a process and know it as, as a method. And I think one of my favorite things um, in teaching were, were the interactive notebooks. And it was for the reasons, actually, that Mina has listed up here. Earlier I talked to Mina, and I mean, I did interactive notebooks for years. And I talked with Mina for probably, you know, 30 minutes or a little bit longer. And we talked about interactive notebooks. And all of a sudden, in that conversation, I was having all these ahas. I was like, going, oh my gosh, I was doing that with interactive notebooks and not even realizing. It wasn't like in my mind that that was the purpose, but I was, I was doing it. And maybe what I can do is kind of show you just a couple of examples here. I was pretty sad I was late to the meeting today. I was supposed to get here early and get the camera out and everything. Um, but I was looking for examples of interactive notebooks that my students have done in my classroom. I think great. Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to put any of the documents? Oh, I didn't think of that. I, I mean, I had some that I could pass around. These were started um, uh, last Thursday, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to share the names of the students, but I thought I would show you just how initially how they're set up. But anyway, um, I always liked to do the interactive notebook along with my students. So that wasn't something I did a lot of when I was a young teacher. As a young teacher, the first few years, I was so um, busy with classroom management that I couldn't just sit down and do an assignment with my students. But by towards, you know, especially towards the end of my career, I did that all the time. In fact, you know, I could set kids up doing something. I could call them up one at a time to my desk and, and work with them individually. And, but that wasn't something that I had the skills and knowledge to do, you know, immediately right away. But it was something I worked towards. So anyway, um, I do have my interactive notebook that I can share with you and just tell you a couple of things about it. And then I, I have uh, an example of how to set them up that we can look at as well. So um, I, it was funny because Mina was showing me her interactive notebooks and they're set up the same way. But the first thing I did was I'd have kids put in a table of contents and uh, they would have a space for um, you know the items they were doing. They'd have a space for page numbers. Um, and then, then we'd have little tabs for units that we'd make. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about the interactive notebook, and I can pass this around, you can kind of get an idea of what the kids were doing by looking at mine, is that it did allow uh, me to build relationships with them. So one of the things that I did was, you know, this academic knowledge piece. There's a lot of academic knowledge in here, but also there's growth. Because I tried to do a lab or an inquiry-based activity once a week, and I had a rubric that would be used to um, grade the lab. So we would do a lab in class, and the student would self-evaluate using the rubric. And then the first time they did that, um, they would come to me, and I had things set up so that, that the rest of the class would, were busy doing all kinds of things, and I would do a grade aloud with them. So what that meant is I'd sit down, 
and I'd use the rubric they had just used to evaluate themselves is a 43210 rubric. And it was a list of items, and I would go through and I would tell them what was going through my mind as I graded their particular lab. Like I might go, oh, you know, I noticed that you've got the independent dependent variable correct here, but you're missing the units. I don't know what the units were. You know, so I'd sit there and I'd do this check mark list, and then when I was done, we would compare how I had graded them with how they had graded themselves. And usually there was a discrepancy the first couple of times, and but they would see what I was expecting and what I thought the rubric meant. Then, uh, once they got good at grading themselves, then they would do peer grading. So before they could bring it to me to grade officially, uh, they would have to have a peer grade. They would grade their own work. They would have a peer grade their work. They would make adjustments, bring it to me. But I didn't do a grade allowed this time. It was just like six hours of grading after school. And I would grade their work and then hand it back to them. And they would look at how they graded themselves, how their peer graded them, how I graded them. And they were allowed to, to, if they wanted, to make revisions and turn it in again. And so I was working towards perfection and towards, um, well, something towards perfection, I suppose, and just towards growth. And what was really great is that by the end of, uh, by second semester, when I was grading their lab, I could grade a lab literally in five minutes or less. And it was pretty quick. And what was, what was nice about it is that the reason I say that I was building a relationship with my students is that when they got their, in, they were excited to get their interactive notebook back and look in it and see what I had said. And when they met with me personally sometimes to be graded, to have it like a grade aloud, you could see they were very excited to be called up to my desk and have that interaction with me. It meant a lot to them because it meant that someone really valued what they were doing and took it seriously. So I think that um, the way I did interactive notebooks is, yeah, it was about knowledge, but it was also about growth and it was about building relationship with the students which I had really never thought about until Mina pointed that out today. Then another thing that I did with the interactive notebooks is at parent-teacher conferences, I would bring the, um, the containers down with all the interactive notebooks from all my classes, you know, like 100 new you. And they were sitting behind my desk, all organized. And the student would come with their parent, and I would have that interactive notebook, and I would turn the whole um, uh, experience around and say, basically have the student share and communicate with their um, parent or whoever was, in, you know, taking care of them, uh, what work they had done in their interactive notebook, and um, to kind of self-evaluate. So I would pro to give them probing questions about, you know, what is it that you think you've done well in the interactive notebook? You know, what are some things you think you can improve on? Is there something in there that you're really excited about? To you know, so that was a really cool experience because. What it did is it allowed the student to communicate with the parent, um, you know, their progress. But it was kind of funny because I never told them that, that I would have them down there at the conference. Some kids were pretty excited to see their interactive notebooks. There were other kids that had a frown on their face <laughs> when I pulled it out and I gave it to them. But then that was kind of a learning experience too because, you know, it meant that they knew the next time um, we met uh, with a parent that the interactive notebook would be there and it was important. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is there's lots of diverse family structures. You have some um, uh, students who spend the night at uh, one house and the next night they spend the night at a different house. It could be a different parent, it could be a friend, it could be someone taking care of them, um, you know, because their parent is incarcerated. Um, so, you know, I got to the point and this sounds maybe kind of strict, but I got to the point where I just said, at the end of the day, in this classroom, you're putting your interactive notebook back in, in that uh, box that's for our class. And it's not leaving the classroom. And then I can grade it right away, I can put it back in. And so that sounds kind of strict, but it got them to use their time better in the classroom because they knew they couldn't take it with them. I did make exceptions, you know, um, but it was tough to make those exceptions because what happens then is uh, sometimes it doesn't come back and you tell a kid, we're starting over and here's mine. And you, you can do the first part that's missing by using mine. 
because that's how important this is, because you keep using stuff that you've done before. So um, it was a way to build a relationship with me. It was a way to build relationship with peers, because they had to have different peers grade themselves. It was a way to get them to be metacognitive, to think about their own thinking and their, their own performance by grading themselves. I mean, there was a lot packed into this. It's kind of funny, because I did not do the interactive notebook the way that our school said you had to do it. I mean, we were trained as an avid school, and there was a particular way to do an interactive notebook. And, you know, I looked at the interactive notebook, and I was all excited about it, and I just did it my own way. And what was kind of funny is it worked for me, and it worked for my students. And at the end of every year, the avid coordinator would come get examples from me and was all excited and said, I need some of these for my report. And I think that's where the ones are that I wanted to bring tonight. Because I had, I had cleaned my room, my files, so that the next teacher who took my place would have a nice clean space. And I set some aside, and I don't have them. And now I have this vague memory that the avid coordinator wanted to use them in her report. So anyway, I've got um, um, this one that I can pass around that you can look at. And then uh, I've also, I've got these. These were done Thursday by fifth graders. And they're in a program called Triumpho. Does anyone know what program? Have you heard about that program? It's really great. If you're interested in, so Triumpho is a really interesting program. Because what we do is in this classroom every Thursday, we have third and fourth graders. And each student has a mentor. And they work on their math and their writing skills. And um, Mentors are college students, and so they help these third and fourth graders uh, with their uh, homework, basically. And students who do the Triumphal program uh, usually stick with it every year until they graduate. And they come back and they report that it was one of the most rewarding experiences they had had. How do you recruit um, mentors for that? Um, well, a lot of them went through similar programs. Um, and if you're interested, um, Dr. Andrew Warnock here um, uh, can get you hooked up. But then I'm, every Thursday, I'm in the other room because they graduate. So in here they're doing their math, you know, and their reading. And they each have a mentor. And they really build a strong relationship with that mentor. And it's, it's really awesome. And then they graduate. And every Thursday, if they're a fifth grader, they're in this other room. And they have um, one mentor for two kids. And what they do in that classroom is they do their homework for 20 minutes, and we help them with that. And then we switch to either a science experiment, a, um, a tour of a lab on campus where they actually get to do some work, and, or they do a math project. Well, I've got an example of their interactive notebook that they just started Thursday, and I'll, I'll pass this around. So we made them a little table of contents. They numbered their pages. We showed them how to number their pages, and they have to be real careful to make sure they're just turned to one page at a time. We had them number just 30 pages, and then we did, um, we have the date, and the first experiment that they did is called the system. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but you get a little vial of, um, it's an observational lab, lab. There's a little vial of a chemical, and have you done this before? Oh, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't say anything because maybe they would like to do it sometime. But it's a great observational lab. It's easy to set up, and uh, it's it's a pretty amazing experience. But then they did their their uh, lab. We told them to design experiments. We gave them different things that they could do with the system, and then um, we told them that it would be nice to have drawings and detailed labels, explanation of what they're doing, and we weren't real strict because it's the first time we've done anything with them. So we made it really fun. And the grading was pretty easy this time, because all we did this time was we made a positive comment, and then we asked a question. And so we're getting to know what our kids can do and kind of what their work looks like, and then maybe what we want to do um, in, in the future with them. So I think um, you can just pass these around and take a look at them. Uh, but the interactive notebook, um, I was thinking of, of the diverse family structure idea. And there is something I want to say about that. Um, and there's more that we can talk about with interactive notebooks. But, um, 
you know, you, you have some kids who have experienced multiple divorces. Uh, you have some kids who have experienced um, uh, siblings or, or parents being incarcerated. You have some parents who have been, or some kids who are being taken care of by siblings. You have um, single parent families um, that have challenges. You have kids that are homeless. Um, you have kids that um, are not uh, documented, and that can create really interesting situations where um, you have parents that don't want to be contacted, um, that are a little bit scared of the school, and yet they, stu they do want their kids educated. Uh, you have, um, uh, there's just so many different situations. I've had single parent moms that were working two jobs and some that wanted me to contact them, you know, all the time. And others that said, I trust you and I don't have time, you know. So it's just like it chokes you up. And it's, it's like they're saying, um, I trust you, I want my kid educated, but I don't even see him at night because I get home at like 11 and they take care of their brother or sister until I get home. And they, we just see each other in passing. I mean, you have all different kinds of situations. And as a teacher, you cannot solve or, you know, support um, those students or those parents uh, or other people in the family and, uh, all by yourself. I think one of the most important things I learned as a teacher is that you are a team. And it feels like you're alone sometimes because you close your classroom door and you're in charge of all those kids, and then the next class comes in, you're charging them, you grade their papers, you go to sports to watch them, you know, concerts and stuff, and it some, sometimes feels like you're alone, especially if you're not in a team uh, of teachers. And so in that case, you've got to remember, I'm not alone. I have counselors, I have administrators, and we work as a team, and we need to speak with one voice, and we, we, need, we need to inform each other and communicate with one another. And I think that's the best way to meet um, diverse family needs, is to know that uh, hopefully you're not alone. Hopefully you're a part of a team, a school team. If you're a part of a, a, like a middle school team, you may be coordinating all kinds of things and speaking with one voice. And it's a very powerful and good thing, you know, can be for your students. So those are just kind of different ideas um, I have. I think. A lot of good things require hard work. So that interactive notebook, like I said, I tried to do a lab between like one, every one to two weeks. It took me at least six hours um, to grade those labs. And that's on top of other assignments and other things I was doing. So um, I'm not saying not to have a life outside of school, because you have to to survive. Um, but, you know, t to make something really, really worthwhile and really high quality and good, it might take some effort and some hard work. In fact, one last comment. I just think um, there's two kind of words of wisdom that I always give my student teachers when I have them. And I say, one, give this job three years before you make a decision of whether it's right or not for you. Uh, because the first year is going to be really hard and the second year gets a little bit easier. And the third year, if you're teaching the same subject, you might even be saying, oh my gosh, they're paying me for this. This is great. But if someone wouldn't have told me that, I think I would have quit after my first year. And yet I stand here before you very gratified with my career and know that I did the right thing for myself. So another thing, another thing to remember is that you've got all these diverse family structures. And I remember at one point getting in my car and my mind was just whirling, and I was concerned about some students, and it was eating me up. And I was about to go home to my little one, and I was in the car, and I just sat, and you know, I couldn't, I could hardly think, and I thought, I w had not put my keys in the car yet, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in my car, I'm not in that building right now. And I'm going home to a family that needs me. And I thought, somehow, right there, this like aha moment, I thought, you know, I've got to figure out how to make a break. 
and, and have a life for myself too because I knew I was dedicated but I also needed to be dedicated to other people outside the school system so at some point you have to find this balance you know, in your life I think the interactive notebook does one other thing maybe that you brought up in our conversation that I think is so important is that um, when I was growing up I loved science and I loved being a knower of science so I could identify a mineral or rock or a bird or a mammal and I was very proud of that from an early age adults would say he's so smart he's going to be a scientist and um, but then uh, I got a professor at the university who taught us like graduate students and he wasn't interested in us knowing science. He was interested in us doing science. And he said, here's the project you're going to do. And I totally freaked out. And I didn't think I could ask a question. I didn't think I knew how to collect data. And quite frankly, I had never been asked to. Imagine that. I had gone through junior high and high school, and I had never been asked to come up with a question. I had never been asked to figure out how to collect data and analyze it, ever. No practice. And all of a sudden, I knew that science was more than just knowing science. There's also doing science. So I think that if you do the interactive notebook correctly, you'll make your kids a doer of science. And maybe by doing science, they'll learn that they're actually really good at it, and there will be a wonderment that will be um, supported and nourished inside of them. Because you just want your kids to have that wonderment and that little spark of being all excited about science. I think there's so. power of it with math, too. If, if you have the right kind of questions you're asking, you'll see that students go about solving things in completely different ways and get them also, again, to ask questions and things like that. So it does, it builds like doers of mathematics as well, not just I'm going to watch you do something and learn this like routine that I'm going to also pattern match. Yeah, that's a brilliant example because I, my whole experience in math throughout my whole career was no math. And this is, this is the way you do it. And I think you're absolutely right. So that's really important to be able to do math. And that there's not one like right way to do that's it. That's right. There's actually a lot of different ways that you can, and you can value those student responses and highlight different ones and show show that that exists, that there's not just my way to do it, but there's more than one way to do it. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, that complements, I mean, I, you know, that is so important uh, in teaching math. I think um, a lot of the people that made me do math <coughs> were actually some of my science professors, which was kind of interesting. So, I wish I had the interactive notebooks that correspond to mine that I was passing around because the thing that's not in mine is all that peer review and self-reflection and the rubrics because they always had to tape their rubric that went with each assignment right by it and those were fun to look at so now I know I think I've got to go talk to my colleague and see if she <laughs> has them because I'm I mean I took a long time picking some out that would represent different students yeah. or types of students. I want to I want to jump in and ask how many of you use notebooks um, that has been assigned by your faculty instructors in any of your science, math, or or tech, you know, engineering classes. Do any of you have classes like your lab classes where you're required in chemistry? Are you required to have a lab notebook? in any of your class, something that you're actually submitting. Now, I'm not talking about a notebook where you're just taking notes for yourself. Yeah, well, Bradley? Like, like right now, or just like in, in my uh, In your undergraduate studies, has it been modeled for you? Has it been modeled for you to use a notebook? Because I think that, no. We did it in methods, but I would say that was my first attempt with them, too. So it was like, we didn't have as much reflection as I would like, but yeah. There's we did some in our methods class. Okay, so, so you did it in methods. Have you done it in anything else? Yeah, in cell biology. Okay, and, and what's, so what is the importance? I just want to take a, you know, here Mike was talking about a lot of, um, he was asking you to think about these five things, but what is so essential 
in your math and science classes about a notebook, an interactive notebook? What do you think? Yeah. That would be really beneficial for students to be able to look back on their notes. To okay. Like, like reinforce their knowledge, um, to be able to learn more. Right. So it's a documentation of of the academic knowledge as well as an opportunity for students to make connections between their prior knowledge and their new knowledge. So one way that you can do that is I had a, a, a former student who was a teacher for 25 years. Now she's a, a teacher educator at the University of Wisconsin. And she had everyone take their notebook and on the left hand side of the notebook, she would have them write down um, their ideas about whatever the topic was before they started. She would say, this is for you to wonder, okay, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, she would say, we're going to keep track of what we're learning in our math or our science class. And then what she would do is at the end of the lesson, she would say, go back and look and see, compare that very first left-hand side where you put down your prior knowledge. And then you've got, you know, several pages of, of what we're doing in, pl in class. And I want you to go see what has changed in terms of your knowledge. So it really gave students a place to document it. So like Valerie said, they could go back and, and compare. What are some other ways you can use the notebook? I know that when I use mine, it's very similar to Mike's, um, I would, they'd have their first graphing assignment. And I wouldn't tell them anything. I'd just say, graph this. Well, how am I supposed to do that? I don't know. I want to know what you know. So just graph this. Then we went through and we figured out you, know, you have to label the accesses, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I gave them the rubric. And we put it in our notebook. And the next lab that we had to graph something, I'd say, where do you find, if you don't know how to do this, where do you find the answer? And they'd have to go back to the rubric. And I called it their cheat sheet. And they thought that was cool because they could have something that, this is how you get an A. This is what the expectations are for graphing. So now they have something to refer back to. So it's a, it's a, a, a help for them, a tool for them. Also for tests, studying for tests, just phenomenal information in those notebooks for doing that. Um, and I didn't let them go out of the classroom either. Um, special I, I occasions too. I, I didn't they didn't come back. I, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. My first year, 1996, I let my students take home the notebooks. Well, I, I was naive and thought they all went yeah. home to the same family, stayed with the same family, brought the notebook home. That was not the case. And that was when I, I quickly learned, and I learned from my, one of my first students, I remember, he said, and I asked him when I started pushing, he didn't feel like home was safe, and so he went and slept in his grandfather's garage. His grandfather was a mechanic, and he didn't want his grandfather to know that he wasn't at home. So he went and slept in whatever cars were in his grandfather's garage. I mean, and this isn't just one story. I mean, it sounds like one, you're going to have lots of these these um, anecdotes. And so I learned very quickly that he had left his notebook in somebody else's car that was taken to his grandfather's garage to be fixed, on, fixed, right? And he was like, I don't know where it is. And, and then as I started, you know, he started talking, we, we discovered that's where it was. Well, his grandfather had actually found it and didn't know why. Anyway, we, we, his notebook came, came back home to school. But, you know, I learned very quickly. And I'm, I'm sure that, Didi, you probably learned this also. You keep your notebooks yeah. at school. Uh -huh. And the kids <laughs> nowadays all have phones. So if they want to study, they just take a picture of it, and they have it for reference. Now they don't have to take their notebook home. They can just take a snapshot of it, and they have it. So um, back in the day, you know, when dinosaurs ruled the earth and we taught, we didn't have that. But, um, <laughs> right. but nowadays, the kids can just pull, or, or they'd say, I really need a graphing rubric. Can I take one home? Yeah, I had extra copies and just give it to them. You know, I mean, it, uh, you shared something too earlier today that I wish I would have thought of and I definitely would have done in class. So one of the things that was kind of interesting to see how much they value their interactive notebooks when you're putting so much energy and work into them is that let's say a student misses a day or two days. When they come back, there are other students that say, oh, do you want to use my, my notebook? I've got all the stuff in here and I'll show you what we did and how to do it. And they were so excited to share their notebook. And I would do the same. I, they were allowed to come ask for my notebook if they needed it on something from the past that they needed, you know, that they had missed or something. So I allowed them to look at my notebook too. But something I wish I would have done is to get students to use each other's notebooks to find things, to see how well they were communicating 
So as an example, I worked in a, in a cancer research lab for a couple years on campus, and I had a notebook just exactly like this that I was that I had to keep and detail everything I did every day. And it had to be really neat so that anyone could look at it and understand everything that I did. And they checked. My um, lab, the head of lab looked at my work, told me, well, you, need, you really need to have this information, you need to do this, you need to do that, because you're not taking this with you when you leave. You know, it stays here, because we need it, because your experiment's going to continue. And then they took my notebook and they put it up on a shelf with all these others. And actually they did have to go back through mine and back to a previous one because they had a mutation in the cell line that we had been working with that was very interesting and they wanted to see, they wanted to try to trace it back to where it had happened. And so I wish I would have had the idea that you did um, because you, you had a really great activity Right. I did, I did um, for, so what are some ideas that you have when I, you said relationship with peers? Besides the, you know, oh, I miss class, can I see your notebook? So Valerie's gone, she says to Noah, can I see your notebook? So then she's up to speed. But what are some other ways that you might have students um, create relationships with peers? So jigsaw activities, yeah. yeah. So jigsaw activities where you have each person is in charge of one aspect of it, and you can have them record that. Um, and in fact, then you can use each other's notebooks to then record the other information. So this, each student has the full, sort of full part of the assignment. <coughs> what are some other things you could do? What do you wish your teachers would have done? <laughs> Well, I think, too, you always have those kids that finish early. I always had kids that finished early, and their notebooks were, like, immaculate. And then use them as peer teachers. Use those students that are done, and they want something to do to maybe bring their notebook over and help somebody who's struggling or help somebody who's been absent. And we just did this in fourth grade yes, the other day um, when I was subbing, and we talked about the difference between teaching and giving. Teaching is showing them how to do it, giving is just giving answers. So we had students who were actually teaching other students. She was finished with all her math, and she was helping another student. They, and there's kids that want to do that. They really want to be helpers, and they really, they don't know how to channel their energy once they're done with whatever it is that you have them doing. So use them as peer tutors, use them as peer teachers. That's a great example. Can you think of, think of something else? What about the task of having so many notebooks to review? Think of, now think about your role as a teacher. You have a lot. He just is like, oh my goodness, I've got a stack of these. How am I going to go through these? He just might just want me to have a life. Right? <laughs> so what do you do? How do you use peers? What are some ideas? Yeah, so what I did is I turned it into a game. And I had, and I did this all the way up until my methods class. So this was not just middle school. My undergraduates, whatever age they were, were very excited to do, um, we did notebook scavenger hunts. And so I would say, these are the, I, you need to look through, so Bradley's looking at Tasha's notebook and says, I can't find, you know, what date, you can write whatever, checking to make sure they're writing the date on items, making sure that they're writing, um, you know, the directions on how they solved some problem. And, and, you know, are they putting enough details in things? Are they writing all their group members' names down? So you, I would make um, a scavenger hunt worksheet, in a sense, and this is how I evaluated it. And instead of me going through both of their notebooks, I would have them go through each other's and look for those. And I'm telling them what to look for. Can you find these details? And did you use the units? That was the that was the number one thing, and it, it doesn't didn't matter if they were in seventh grade or they were in college grade. Forgetting to put units when we did labs, right? That was a big thing. Did you did you label the axes on your graphs? That was another thing that you know, <laughs> right? So lots of opportunities, and it's another way to create. So I didn't, uh, you know, they would tell each other, you know, Bradley would say, "Don't oh, you miss this? You're going to get some points off." They, I didn't care. Right, the point was that they, they ended up creating, I could hear the whispering happening, that quickly there were some corrections being made. They're like, you know, if you just add this in here, you're gonna get an A. 
That happened all the time, and that was fine. I'd act like I didn't know it was happening because it creates a, it creates this sense of community that they're helping one another, and that's really, you know, what I wanted in that for that assignment. Somebody, oh, hands, go ahead. We we also made a commitment to our language arts teachers in in um, in our team that we would grade for um, punctuation, spelling, and the whole bit. Talk about trying to grade all that. You know, plus grading the science, we were grading the language arts. So what I did with them, because they love red pencils, they loved them in seventh grade. They all got a red pencil and they switched. And so they were then grading the language arts. They would circle if they didn't capitalize something. They would put in the period for me. They would say SP above spelling. And then I didn't have to grade that piece. I could just give it a quick, we did a two, a two one zero so for so many errors. Or they could get together and they could say, this is wrong, like you said. I don't care, fix it. Fix it right now before you turn it in. Because that helped my language arts team um, make sure that they were not only seeing that language arts is this, is this isolated class, you have to be a good writer and you have to be a good reader of science. You cannot isolate science and try and ex communicate somebody your findings with spelling mistakes that I can't figure out what the word means. So I let them do that too, so I didn't have to grade all the punctuation and everything. The kids did it themselves before they turned it in. And I would recommend modeling all those things. Yes. Like show them side by side, like what <coughs> two examples and like what's the difference of, between these two examples or why would I say this one gets a two versus this Correct. one gets a one? What are the differences? So that their brain is processing what kind of things do I need to actually do in order to get and we worked with our language arts teachers to develop that rubric for that language arts for science and social studies. So it wasn't as strict as their language arts rubric would be, but yet we were holding them accountable for their communication piece. So it was it was you know, interesting. One of my favorite things too with the peer grading was when they would, and this is something they probably got the most excited about, is um, I think when they when they peer graded the labs. Everyone kind of had pretty much the same thing, you know, on some of these labs, depending on what I was doing. Um, sometimes not, because sometimes I would give them the choice of what variable to test in an experiment. So different labs were um, roughly kind of the same topic. So may maybe it's a wind turbine, and someone's testing number of blades or blade angle or weight of blade. You know, so not everyone's experiment was exactly the same, but I think the thing that students got the most excited about is when they were grading each other on things that really varied from student to student. So for example, um, I might have, um, they, maybe they had to um, write a, a story, I can't remember what I call these, but um, the English teachers have a name for it, but it, a story that gets at how the eye works or how the ear works. And they're kind of funny stories and they had to have like a little model with it and they had to have certain things within that story to show maybe um, you know the energy transfers through the eye or, or the ear, and so they were grading each other on that. But everyone's story was kind of different or clever or poetry, because I did a lot of science poetry, and so it wasn't just. I mean, I always had a rubric where the poem had to have particular things that um, would help someone better understand a concept, you know. And so when they graded each other on those things, they, it, it just seemed like they had a lot of fun. There was just a lot, a lot of joy in it. We didn't, we didn't really, when I did the notebooks in my ramp up class, we didn't really ever grade each other's, but we did a lot of these things called rough draft, rough draft talks. Mm -hmm. So students would be presenting their work to the class and ask for feedback. So it was like a way of saying, I'm not wrong, but how can I improve? what I have written, um, and so it was like framing it in a different way instead of a, kind of like a checking off way, it's more like how can I improve what I already have written down, and I, I really liked that. Yeah, because it creates a sense of, it's it's a collaborative, cooperative yeah. um, environment rather than one that's competitive. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a couple oh. things, let me do a couple things yes. here. One is, I want to pass around, because Janet was talking about using science notebooks in her math methods class, and I have a former student who let me copy part of her science methods notebook. I don't even know where she is teaching at. Do you know Alyssa Carter? I don't know if she's, I think she moved to another part of the state. And first of all, I asked her because 
she has an amazing she has amazing penmanship. So that was one reason. <laughs> Secondly, she was just super organized, and you're going to flip through here and go. Actually, there's a whole section in here on observing Lynn teach. So it says Conrad Ball Middle School. So she was going oh to, to Lynn's class. <laughs> and she's recording Lynn floating around room and helping students. She's writing. These are her observations of being uh, in Lynn's classroom. It's all lives. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around just so you can see this while, while we're talking. The other thing is a book that I know Lynn, Mike, and I don't know if Dee Dee has it, but mm, we all yeah, have this. This is a, an excellent resource. So I'm going to... Um, pass this around. It says the word science. Imagine that it says math or engineering or technology because it really doesn't matter what the content is, really how you use it. So while we're chatting, I'm just going to pass these around if you want to look at them. Do you know another thing I use the interactive notebooks for that I just remembered? So um, in my classroom, <clears throat> each week there were two kids in my class that had to be greeters. And that job rotated. So what that meant is that if I was helping to facilitate a lab, or maybe I was giving some background information, and the phone rang, one of those two students would have to go answer it. And we modeled how to answer the phone. So they might, you know, say, Mr. Viney, um, they really need to talk to you. And so then I could get on the phone, but if not, they took care of it. Another thing they did is if there was anyone who came to the classroom, those two were supposed to get up and greet them. And part of the greeting, was to show to use the interactive notebook to show what we were doing <clears throat> and kind of what they were learning and how they would know how they learned it in the end. And so it was great because you know whatever would be happening, that whole kind of um, I don't know, it's not stress, but the, the feeling you get when your principal walks in just through a walkthrough <laughs> unex <Sweat>. unannounced. <laughs> there was there were no announcements at our school and they would try to get to your room twice a week at least. And sometimes they'd just walk through. And what was so great is all of a sudden I'd look up and my counselor or my principal or assistant principal, they would be talking to those two students, shaking their hands and looking at their interactive notebook, looking up at the board, what we were doing, going around talking to students. And sometimes it took me a while to notice that they were even in the classroom. It was great. So I would highly recommend greeters. And they used those interactive notebooks to communicate what we were learning. I think another thing, too, um, not done interactive notebooks, but if you do a lot of group projects, it's um, I finally figured it out how to do it better than what I did when I was first started. Because you just you give them a grade, and then the kid's like, but I they didn't do any work. They got a group grade, but the person was never there. So I had a group grade, and then I let them grade themselves and their partners. And they knew about this before the projects even started. So everybody got the same grade for the project, but you didn't get the same grade for the work ethic unless you and your partner decided that you did the same amount of work. So they fill out a form, a 321, and if Mike and I were partners and I put down a two and Mike put down a two, we'd have to say why we gave each other this that grade. But if Mike put down a three and put down a two for me, Mike had to explain why he did more work than I did. And then we had a conversation about it, the, the group and me, so that we talked about, well, is it, is it, and it was not comfortable sometimes for kids. Um, most of the times they ratted each other out pretty well and they all, and they all owned up to it. I mean, they said, yep, I should have a two and Mike should have a three because Mike was there every time. He wasn't messing around, he was on task, and he should have a better grade than I did. I could have been better at doing some of the work. So really then they got two project grades, one for that, the project itself, for the content, but then one for the work. And then when parents come in, you can explain to them, yes, they got the same grade here because the project was really good, but here's where the kids got something a little different. I didn't weight it that the same, but parents, that's a really hard thing with parents because you'll get parents that say, my kid did all the work and got the same grade as this kid. Oh. Relationship kind of with family. Yep. Yeah. Using the notebook to start a conversation. Yeah. And it's really powerful when you open up that, not you, but that student opens up that notebook, the parents, is like, parents are there and like, why does my kid have enough? And I've already called, I've already done all my due diligence before parent-teacher conferences. But when they open up the notebook and it doesn't look anything like yours, you got it. That's what it is. It's just in black and white. This is empty, 
this is not. This should look like this. So they are very powerful at parent-teacher conferences. And then you get the kid who's awesome, and you say, oh my god, look at this. It's just, this yeah. is why your child has an A, because they are so diligent in their, in their studies. Yeah. So you just got a lot of information. Should we get up and just take a break for a second? Is that what you were about to say, mm -hmm. Dee? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm, this is what I'm wondering. Let me see if I've got this right. Tell me if I'm right. Biology, math. Biology, chemistry, chemistry, math. This is really great, right? Because this is what I'm gonna. This is what I'm thinking. We might do for a few minutes. You're gonna get up. You're gonna move around. Get some food. Not wake up the baby. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pair up based on your content area. And I want you to think about. Tati's already got some ideas. She's got the wheels turning here. I want you to think about. You've heard some different strategies. You have some examples in front of you. I want you to think about at least one way that you think that you could use interactive notebooks. Think about, is it going to be middle school, high school? Think about what you know grade level. And brainstorm some ways that you, like one specific way that you think you could use them and, and why. And really think about these connections that we just talked about. You know, to help them build academic knowledge, to connect their prior knowledge with their new knowledge, relationship with the teacher. I used to go in and write all kinds of reflective, <laughs> what's I, my, too, yeah, I used to write all stuff. kinds of comments in the notebook to have a relationship with the student, um, relationship with their peers. We talked about a lot of examples in relationship. Oh, and I forgot, I'm sorry, she's biology. We'll, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get some connections over here. I forgot we've got, Wesley's not a very good partner for Amy, but, um, <laughs> so we'll, but you can come over and join Noah and, and Bradley because they're also biology. And, and think about how you can use the notebook. If you're not really sure, a starting place is thinking, how, Mike said this in the beginning, use this to, to spark wonderment. I wonder why they even invented the lattice method to do multiplication, right? I don't care, it doesn't be, it can be anything. I wonder why this works this way. I wonder why pH is so important, you know? Um, so whatever you wanna do, you can think about using that if you're really stuck think about what do you want your students to wonder and then you don't even have to think of it as a notebook think of it as a portfolio <laughs> it's their learning for the whole year you know people take portfolios to jobs this is kind of your job seventh grade science this is your portfolio you're showing your work it, one other okay. thing to think about too is that um you know you've got students of all different kinds of abilities too in yeah. your class and what do how what does the interactive notebook look like for them? And sometimes you have to have <clears throat> help from people in integrated services to help you figure that out. But you do a lot more copying for them. That's another thing that you have to think about mm -hmm. is that there will be um, kids that need some scaffolding or um, some accommodations. Okay, why don't we get up and move? Aaron, we'll come back. back, right? So pair up with Venus and Tantu, and you guys are responsible for filling your Aaron friend in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if, you had a notebook, if you had a notebook, you could hand you the notebook show over. Show her what you wrote. <laughs> so come over and get some oh. food. Is that this? No. No. Oh, no, that's just an example of it. Of a I gotta read that. I'm afraid to read it. <laughs> oh, is that when they came? Oh, that's when we did that thing. <laughs> Okay. I didn't realize I didn't ignore Amy, but then I looked over and I'm like, wait a second, we've got a biology teacher over there. So are you doing students in general? Are you going to do it next semester?